Okay, so let's start with the, the, the main showcase of this release, and that is the Magic Dungeon. You guys have seen me do some tutorials around this and using this as a bit of a backdrop, but this is finally ready for you to download. A few things to keep in mind, like, you know, what, what is, why did I do this? And why is this even significant, right? You know, this, this scene right here is just like a, I call it the mega demo. It's, it's probably too big to play. There's too much going on, but I just kind of couldn't help myself put everything in this so you could see, you know, how the system works. Um, we'll go through actually building one of these, but, but why it matters. I've used this before this example, this is Dwarven Forge's mega pack. Uh, it's an add-on pack to create essentially a fiery dungeon. And you get, you know, a handful of pieces with this and, you know, multiple types of those and this is what they look like. And you can make some pretty cool dungeons in 3D in the real world. But this pack is $400 and I'm looking at just, you know, a few of these packs at the top of the Dwarven 4 page and they're, they're all hundreds of dollars. And of course you get to make one scene out of it. You can't make a whole dungeon. Uh, they're limited in terms of what these, these pieces can do. But once you get this digital, I said, you know, could I make an entire system like this for $7 instead of, you know, thousands of dollars? And that's really what the aim was um, when building the, the Magic Dungeon is to be able to do this. So you're looking at all the different pieces. This mega demo scene is, uh, there's no prefabs in here, although I made it with prefabs. I released all the prefabs and I just, um, you know, let everything kind of be loose so you could just kind of move things around easily. So today we're going to walk through some sample scenes that I've made, a bunch of stuff that you can come in and play with now. I'm also going to give you some tutorials on some modules, how to make a trap with active tiles. Uh, we're going to go through uh, not just, um, you know, the, the release content, but I'm going to show you how to do some things that I think you'll really like. So even if you're not a subscriber, you're not going to use this, jump around to the timestamps and look at stuff that you might find interesting because, you know, I, I promise you, you'll be able to use some of the stuff in your own game. So let's jump into it. First, just to show you how to get to this new content, um, you want to make sure that if you have a uh, Bailey Wiki, if you're a subscriber, you want to make sure you've got Cabal Dungeon, the Maps Premium and the Maps Towns modules enabled. Once you have those enabled, it will introduce a bunch of new compendiums for you. I've searched my compendiums for BaileyWiki already, which filters down to all of my stuff. If you're a first time user, all of these are probably in your, and if you're using compendium folders, they're probably all in your default folder and you can move them into the proper folders, actors, journals, and whatnot. You see all the actors has all of the prefabs. These first four are for the dungeon system. The, uh, all of the Magic Dungeon is inside of the BaileyWiki Actors uh, prefab under Magic Dungeon. If I open that up and I click this little icon here, this is to import all of the folder structure and all of the prefabs into your world. You can feel free to import other things, but I'll just show you these today. I've already imported those. Uh, you also want to get journal entries for the dungeon. This is needed to power the uh, dungeon draw stuff. So if you open this up, you'll see there's a bunch of dungeon draw things you need to import. Those will import into your world, into that folder. Um, you also want to get the macros that I've updated. So uh, they're mostly in the towns and the Tome of Dust and Shadow. Tome of Dust and Shadow is where I put special effects like all of the new FX Master uh, kind of redone macros. And then in the uh, Bailey Lake Maps Towns macros, it's where I keep most of my um, assets. So this is the new macros, for example, to help you configure assets at scale. And then finally, your new scenes um, are going to be in the Bailey Wiki Dungeon um, compendium under Magic Dungeon. They're all under modular. I will introduce some optimized versions here once DF Architect uh, updates, and then you can see all of the assets and even the magic circle effects. I do want to point out if you want the trireme, you have to open up the premium compendium. Uh, you can just start typing in trireme and you'll see these two here are these multi-level prefabs, the new ones that we'll go over today. Let's walk through the new uh, assets under the Magic Dungeon. I can open this up and see a bunch of stuff here. Uh, I want to point out that there is a special flame trap that you want to import into your world. We'll talk about that when we talk about the trap tutorial. And then you've got a bunch of prefabs and then you've got a bunch of tiles. 
So we're going to walk through just the basics of all of these, and then I'll have a separate video where we actually build the dungeon together and you can see how all of these work uh, in real time. First of all, you have um, this concept of multi. So if I type in the just the word multi and I see all my magic dungeon things, these are all special tiles or special assets, I should say. And if I turn on quick edit mode and I go, for example, to this uh, dragon head and I click on some of these other See, we can get closer to you can see you can see these. Uh, this is a decor item that's just flexible. Depending on what you want in your particular dungeon, you can just select these. It's already set as an overhead tile. It's built into the prefab. You can just drag it out here and into your world. There are other um, things here that have uh, the ability to change their face, if you will. This is the top of a gazebo, more of like a stone gazebo, and you can change it to all sorts of different materials. You have the same ability here with these uh, lights. So this one, for example, you can uh, drop it in as a prefab and then change the color of the tile. Of course, it does come with a light already embedded in it, and you would have to change the color of that light as well. I'll show you that macro uh, here today also. This sconce works in the same way. Everything defaults to fire, but if there's an element that you need to be able to change to uh, change the motif, um, I've included that um, generally as a, as a multi-face tile. Second, we're going to talk about bases. Bases come as prefabs. Of course, you can just use the tiles if you want to, but the prefabs themselves come with uh, lighting and walls already set up because some of them have you know some of this effect here where I'm containing the light within this, these transparent tiles. These tiles are transparent so that you can put any type of background in any color and it will just automatically flow through and keep your, um, your dungeon in the same motif. Uh, I mentioned that there are some already included lights with some of these in case you want to try one versus another. They're already built in. There are already walls to contain the special lighting around these lava flows. And you can, once you place them, if you decide you want to be able to walk through these walls and things like that, you can make those changes. Next, you've got uh, this uh, chain platform. I'm just going to talk about this briefly. Uh, this is a set of tiles that are all built in kind of a modular way. And the benefit to this is you can really put anything on chains. Even these little connector pieces are separated. And you can, you know, rotate these uh, depending on what environment you're you're hanging your platform. You can even change the platform out entirely if you want to. So this is just set up in a flexible way so that you can deploy, you know, hanging assets really kind of anywhere or any way that you want. You have a number of elevation options. Just call them elevation. Um, these stairs, for example, they all have walls and lights built in. These lights are meant to be more of like a portal, so you can enable these for portal type stuff. Um, you can see I've included these dragon heads here, so you can change these just like you did before. And you can just use these as building blocks. Um, these are platforms that can be deployed and look really good just to change the elevation of a particular room to vary the elevation up, or they look good also just sitting in the middle of a lava lake, that sort of thing. Some of these elevation pieces, like the platform, again, have lighting built in that you can turn on and off. This one has two different types of lighting, which you can adjust as you see fit. There's a number of lighting options. Mostly over here, you've got, you've got a cauldron, you've got the brazier version of that, you've got these different lights that I showed you earlier. You also have pillars of different varieties. And those pillars themselves can have lighting attached to them. So this one is just, just for convenience. It's easier to delete than to add to it. And if you want your pillar to have this sort of glowing effect around it, you can do that. You also have things like an obelisk. This obelisk also comes with different lighting types that you can turn on and off. I mentioned other pillars. These pillars all have, they're kind of specialty pillars. They all have overhead tiles attached to them. And this is so that you can create more three-dimensionality with your space. You can have these, I call them spikes, kind of sitting over everything. You can even have this sort of hand that can come in and you can make it very large, which we'll give you examples of. Um, but this hand itself is also uh, enabled with uh, a, just a different 
a different texture, a different um, version of it. We'll talk about these some of these other things like lava flows when we get into actual building. I want to point out here also you have all of these different tiles. These are to create elevation. These tiles are meant, meant to be able to work with each other. So if I wanted to build a giant platform middle of the room, I can do that and they just connect up. You can even sort of squeeze them in, make them larger and smaller. Um, you'll see examples of how we use this. These are also just more elevation options. If you want to create staircases, you want to create overhead walkways, you can do all of that. You can use all these different stairs, uh, which have different modular functions, which I'll get into. I also included the main lights in terms of the designs. So you can just copy, you can just grab this, copy it with control C and paste it into another world or another scene. Um, it, and you can see how I've configured these lights if you want to use these. This is the liquid area, like what you see here, where you can animate um, you know, lava and things like that. And then you've got your inverse absorption and your adaptive luminance versions of the light. These other tiles are used in special circumstances. For example, if I want to be able to walk over a lava area, I can use this asset and all of a sudden it's, you know, it's now walkable. It can have tokens traverse it. I have uh, various types of uh, just drop in bridges. You just need to adjust your walls, which we'll go through an example of that. I have stalactites or stalagmites, I think they're called, and these other components. These are just, they're so simple that, you know, they can go in the middle of lava flows and things like that, but I didn't want to try to build walls around them and things like that. You certainly could, but you'll find that you can really distract and overdo walls in your, in your world. I've got some other things which we won't go into, things like walls. There's another type of pillar that has some uh, show through. Uh, you've got these pillars with the chain combined in the middle. And I did just want to point out, there's also, what I'm really excited about, I included all of these textures to be able to do the things that I showed you where you can quickly uh, change the background of the motif. And you've got all the different varieties of those, like ice, fire, void, and things like that. But I have these two special ones. This one's all black. And you can use this with Dungeon Draw to draw blackened areas of the floor. And this one is a... Um, a special tile that actually lets you uh, create uh, difficult terrain and will draw terrain today. And I'll show you in the build example how we draw terrain. So you add all of these together and you can create really awesome stuff. You combine it with dungeon draw and you're completely liberated to draw your own dungeons the way that you want to. I do want to just talk about this one asset really quick. This is called the drop and um, it's it's built to be sort of flexibly changed around. I wanted to be able to show this sort of really interesting change in elevation. You'll see how we use this in another build, but essentially, you know, if I want to use this at all, which of course I can hide it or delete it, my players can uh, come down and into a separate uh, area and they might go to a different part of the dungeon. You can use monks active tiles or multi-level token to teleport them once they get there. I included this door as well that does not have a way to get to it in case you wanted to have players, you know, all of a sudden walk out that door and down into the lava pit or maybe wonder how they could get into that door and have to fly down and things like that. You can just move this around, uh, put it on any wall that you want to, and it's really easy, flexible. Of course, you can just delete that door entirely as well. It all comes with the prefab, which has a light built into the middle of it. And it also has, um, you know, transparency in the bottom. So you can change your motif quickly, or you can just put, you know, a rock floor, or you can put anything else down there um, and turn your light off, or change your light. So between all of these assets, you've got more than what you could find in Dwarven Forge and some. And because they're digital, you can create really dungeons of any size and continue to build them. You don't, you're not just limited to just building one sort of small room where you might have an encounter. You can really kind of keep building as much as you want. And of course, you can uh, use all of the other elements of my modular system to continue to add to this. And we'll go through examples of that. In terms of the new sample scenes that you have access to, there's seven sample dungeons that I've built. Most of them, not all of them, use Dungeon Draw but there are specific uh, journal entries for all the dungeon draw scenes. What dungeon draw does is it drops in that 
that journal entry here and it uses that to read where the wall should be and things like that. So Scene Packer will automatically pull all of those in when you import uh, using Scene Packer. And so everything should work out of the box and it'll ultimately render like this. So you've got all of the different prefabs that I've used. I've left this in a modular state so you can move things around and experiment with them. I will be providing optimized versions of these where I will uh, eliminate all of the prefabs, I'll flatten all the tiles, and it'll just help uh, in just in terms of uh, performance. You guys can do this yourselves, but I just wanna make sure that you know that, uh, that these are this way intentionally so that you can manipulate them and see how everything was put together. Okay, so here we're gonna actually build a trap today. We're gonna to use Monk's active tiles and also token bar, which is another of Monk's um, things. This is uh, Magic Dungeon 2, which I've done, uh, you know, I used a bunch of different components and you kind of make your way through what is essentially a long dungeon. And it's got cool effects like these hands, um, these stone hands that kind of come up here. I've got this distressed floor that I was able to just draw in. And I'm going to turn the lights on. And what we're going to do is focus on these traps here. Okay, so let's build a trap, flame trap, that's going to go off if our players uh, fail, if they enter this trap area because they fail a perception check uh, here. Okay, so first let's build the trap itself. Now I've got a couple of assets already in here. I've got this uh, special light that gets really bright that uses the torch effect. Um, I've got uh, a couple of animated tiles that you can't see here, but I'll just play one of them. These are tiles from uh, Gorgon, if you haven't seen these before. And I've got an identical tile here down below that spews fire out of the dragon head that's down here. And then I've actually got uh, some sound effects that we'll be calling uh, using active tiles. Okay, so if we go into my trap tile and we go to triggers, first of all, I wanna make sure that this is active. And then I want anyone who enters to uh, have a 100% chance of setting this off. You may want to tick this, once you get it all set up, you may want to select once per token so you don't have a token accidentally set it off twice. Because we're actually going to cause some damage with this particular trap here. So a couple of things that we want to do, uh, we're going to add the normal stuff like uh, pause the game. We also want to stop token movement. I'll go ahead and snap them to grid. This will make sure the game pauses and they uh, they, they can't move any longer. Because uh, we, we want to allow the trap to sort of take effect. The next thing we want to do is actually attack the player. And what I've created, uh, and it's inside of your um, uh, Magic Dungeon folder, is traps and special. I've got this thing called a flame trap. And if I open it up, I see that it's got a single attack. I just called the attack itself flame trap as well. And that trap basically causes 66 of fire damage. And it's a, it's a dexterity saving throw of 15. Uh, and otherwise the player gets 66 of fire damage. So that's its one thing. I don't have to import that trap into my scene. I just have it sitting in here. I'll show you how we set this up. So we're going to say attack. And uh, we want it to attack any, I'm going to say any of the tokens that are inside of this region. There's probably only going to be one, but maybe there will be a couple. And then the actor to perform the attack, if I click those little crosshairs, I can go over here and select Flame Trap. And it will then give me all of the attacks available under Flame Trap, which I've set one up. I will go ahead and do this as a public role and click Update. And now when a player walks into here, they have a 100% chance of, of being hit by, uh, or being attacked by that actor. Okay, next I'm actually going to launch all of the pieces that I need here. So I'm going to play a sound file. The sound file is in my Premium Towns folder. I'm going to play it for uh, everyone. I'm gonna set the volume, maybe not to max. And I don't want it to loop, and I'm gonna go ahead and restrict it to the scene. Now the sound of this flamethrower will go off when the player walks in. Now I want to play animation. I'm going to select the entity that I, that I want. 
and you can't see it, but it's this invisible entity here. I'm going to start that animation for everyone. And it'll just play one time through. I'm not going to loop it. Then what I want to do is I want to activate on my light layer, this light. And I basically want to just activate it. So I'll click update. And then I need to turn that light off after a period of time. Now I happen to know that my sound file goes for about six seconds. So I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to say wait. So I've got logic here and I've got filters. So we're going to say delay actions by six seconds. Everything after this point will be delayed at six seconds. And I'm going to deactivate that light. Okay. Let's test and see how our trap is doing. So one thing I found is I have to, uh, I'm gonna, I, I think I want to have the other flame go at the same time. So I'm going to add the ability to play animation going to pick my second flame, start it for everyone. And I want to move that right up with my other start animation. And I just want to make sure that those tiles are above all my other tiles. And as I enter the area, my flames come on, I can hear my sound, my light lights up. And after six seconds, everything goes back to normal. So that looks pretty good. Let's look at the attack that's been happening. I didn't see the attack work. So let's go reset some things. I think one of the problems here is I'm using uh, tokens within there. I think what I can only do in this case, in the way this is set up, is I can only really attack the triggering token. So let's change it to the triggering token. Um, and then let's uh, display this as a uh, as a role message. We'll do it as a public role here. And let's see what happens with those changes. Okay, so now I've uh, my my player's been targeted. I now have to succeed on the DC saving throw. Uh, which I've done, and so now I can, you know, apply damage the way that I might normally apply damage. And that's how you create the, the, that part of the, the trap. Now let's go work on this perception check to see if we can uh, alert ourselves of this trap first. So we're going to activate this. 100%, 100% chance to trigger it. Uh, eventually we'll do it probably once per token. And we'll do it on enter. I'm just going to save that really quick. Now let's add some things. So first we want to request a role. Now request a role may not be on your list. The way that you get it is you actually have to install a Monk's token bar. So Monk's token bar actually uses Monk's active or active tile triggers uses Monk's token bar to request roles. Also has another function that introduces. If you've got them both on and active, and you can disable the token bar, it normally uh, shows a token bar, you can disable that like I have, and then it introduces the option to request a role in your, your actions. And what I can do is I can say, okay, the triggering token, I want to uh, request a perception check. And I'll say, uh, I want to have this uh, be guaranteed to succeed at first. So I'm going to just set it to one for right now. And we'll say that this is uh, this is a blind GM role. We don't want to have, or this is a private GM role. We don't have others uh, see that the role is happening. We're going to actually bypass the dialogue. We're going to automatically roll as somebody walks through it. And we're going to uh, continue. And actually, if they fail... Uh, we don't want to continue so let's try this okay so it's an easy uh, dc they're definitely going to pass it and if they do all the good things happen uh, one of those things is we're going to deactivate this trap tile 
Uh, we're also going to pause the game and we're going to stop token movement. And let's do a notification. Let's do a, a chat message first of all. Um, I smell gas. You have spotted a trap. We'll use the triggering token to say that. We'll have them say it in character. We'll even do a little chat bubble and we'll say it for everybody. Now we're going to send a notification. This will make sure that this shows up for our player. We'll call it a warning notification and just for the token owner. Okay, so if we fail this DC, none of this stuff happens and we continue through this, uh, this tile and we can continue all the way through to where we actually trigger this tile here. So let's see if this works. We've spotted a trap, so we've succeeded on our DC of one. Uh, this is a uh, private uh, GM role. And then the, the message that actually comes out is you've spotted a trap, I smell gas. And let's just check over here. And we can see that our tile has been deactivated. Now let's change our DC. Let's set it to 30. Something that would be really hard to succeed on. So what I figured out is I can't pause and stop my movement. Otherwise, it'll do that regardless. I want this perception check to happen one way or the other. And then if it does, then this will be deactivated. Now I run the risk of uh, dragging my players, dragging their players all the way through to this side. And, uh, and let's just see if that actually works. So we want them to pass and turn this off, but we'll see if it has enough time to do that. Okay, so we've seen that once we drag it through, it does that, um, that test and then it stops my player and then let's see what happens here and it's deactivated that tile so we might have actually enough time to make that all work try this one more time we'll activate our trap our players decide that they're going to run all the way through here and yes we it, we do successfully stop here uh, for some reason, probably just because that's the way the setting is set up, but it does disable it and it doesn't launch the trap. Let's change our DC back to 30, which is going to be really hard to make. And we will try our test our trap one more time. Let's make sure they're activated. And this time we should fail it. And sure enough, we fall into our trap and we get attacked. So I think we've got a pretty good system working here. You guys can let me know in the comments if there's a better way to do what I've just attempted. But so far, I'm pretty happy with this. I'm going to change this DC. And you guys may have to change this if you get this map. You need to change it back to something that uh, you're comfortable with. I think what I'll do is leave the DC in... Um, a one or a 30 state just so you can play with it just but just make sure you play with these um these settings so that it works the way that you want to now we're going to look at uh, how to use dungeon draw for some things now this sample dungeon actually uses only a little bit of the dungeon pieces and otherwise it uses a bunch of the castle pieces you guys have seen these before now i'm just uh introducing these as prefabs connect everything up and now I'm using Dungeon Draw to make hallways and connect things up uh, even better. Now, what I want to do is I want to uh, create uh, maybe a different size hallway. So I'll come to Dungeon Draft or Dungeon Draw, and uh, we're going to just add a hallway here. Um, maybe we're going to make this one a little bit wider. There, now I've got a little bit wider room. I just drew it. Um, I'm using the whatever default map config that I have set up with this already. 
If you need to assign a new config, just come to your themes. Uh, you can create these custom themes based on, on mine. I'll try to do something here where you guys can easily import these. But if you like a particular theme like Castle, you just click on it and it'll apply that theme as your, as your main theme to the page here. But maybe I want some, uh, I, I want some difficult terrain. So I'm going to come in here, you know, I've got fire, poison, you've got all the default ones uh, for dungeon draw. I'm going to create one, use one that I've created for you guys called stone difficult. That's what I've called it. Uh, until there's an import function, you guys might have to build these yourself from the assets. Um, or you can come in here to this map that should everything have everything already set and you should be able to build off of that. So now my theme painter is going to paint difficult um, terrain. And so if I come in here to my painter and I just start drawing, maybe I want it to look, you know, kind of follow the, you know, the tiles here a bit. There, now I've got all of a sudden difficult terrain. So as my players walk in here, they'll say, oh, wow, this is really hard to get through. Once they even do get through it, then they've got to fight through all these overhead tiles uh, that are set up. They've got to fight all these overhead tiles here that I can hide enemies in and things like that. So that's how you can use Dungeon Draw to just really quickly make changes to, uh, to maps like this. Here's another large sort of boss type room um, and I've done the same thing here. I've drawn, I've used Dungeon Draw to draw these floors in. In this case, I used Dungeon Draw to draw in black because that's another uh, texture option that I've that I've offered. So this would be like, you know, you could fall down into that hole indefinitely. It just examples how this stuff works together. The fifth sample scene actually uses just tiles, really. This is the only prefab that I used in the scene. Otherwise, I just used uh, tiles for everything. And, uh, and I also used the, the bridge, the modular bridge system. So you can create a bridge of, of any type, um, different materials. And these are all just um, tiles that I put together to make the, the whole bridge work. Ultimately, um, I will be optimizing the site so it's just single tiles and, uh, and really performant. This is a really cool scene. This is uh, as you're approaching essentially what is a uh, underground maybe um, you know magic fortress. If I turn on um, Ripper's 3D preview, you can see you wouldn't play this as a 3D uh, map, but this just gives you an idea of what we're looking at. Uh, you've got these like huge castle walls, and then you've got these towers on both sides, and, uh, and some things going on in the middle. And as you approach, so I'm using these prefabs, like this gate is an entire prefab. And as I approach it, you can also hear some ambient sounds. So this is a portcullis, and I'm using ambient doors to be able to create those sounds. And I'm just calling out for those doors specifically. Uh, here's the portcullis and, um, you know, closing and opening sounds for that. And then over here for this one, this one I'm using a, a door close and a door open. It's a big heavy door. So a uh, great little module if you guys haven't figured that one out yet. And just with levels and other things that I'm using here, it just makes for a really cool environment with a lot of tactically interesting options, right? So I can go into this tower. I can go all the way up to the top floor and I can fire out of my arrow slits up at the top floor. So again, levels, better roofs, ambient doors kind of came together to make this scene uh, do what it's doing here. Now this last sample scene is interesting. It might look small to you, but check this out. There's actually seven floors of scene that go up and up and up, all the way to where you can have this kind of final battle at the top. Um, I'll do a quick run through of it, but there's a lot going on here. I recommend you look into the scene to see how I use things like holes and other components to make everything work. But these are just the same tiles that you saw, same assets. Uh, but now I can actually run up, you know, through all seven floors. And, you know, there's different things that I have to do. You know, there's not an easy way to traverse some of these things. Um, you've got to make checks and things like that. But you can see I can add really cool encounters as I go up. 
but I can also continue to battle. Like, let's say I went up a few floors, I could still see uh, down below, if I had another token on here, I could see uh, someone, another enemy or an ally uh, down below that uh, I can continue to help or fight as we fight our way up this, this crazy dungeon tower and ultimately getting to the top. And I'd be able to see, in fact, I'll just show you an example. Let's put a token down here. And you can see for my guy up the top, I can see through this hole and I can see my ally or my enemy down there below and continue to attack. If you're curious what this tower looks like, this is a 3D preview. This kind of gives you an idea of how it's set up. Um, you Again, you wouldn't play this in three dimensions unless you made some changes to this. Um, but this is, uh, this is essentially what this map looks like if you were going to uh, look at it in 3D. So uh, just another way to completely think differently about how these work. And again, that's levels and better roofs that makes this, this type of environment work. And of course, with your players, uh, they wouldn't see all the stuff. This is just what you see as the GM. Okay, so I love this, what I'm about to show you. You guys have probably seen my triremes before. There's a lot of different versions of them because it's highly customizable as an asset. But what I've done here is I've actually made the triremes so that there's only two versions now. There's just the regular one, and then there's the one with the speed upgrade. The speed upgrade is um, a whole next level with more ores on it and that sort of thing. That's why I had to make two different ones. Um, but let me show you what you can do now. So if I turn on quick edit mode, I've got this upgraded hull. Well, the normal hull that it comes with is here. And I'm just using multi-phase tiles to be able to do these hull upgrades in real time. I even have this version where you can sleep on the deck of your trireme in case you want to make a, a base out of it, for example. But that's not the only thing I can customize. If I go up to the sails, I can uh, give myself white sails or red or blue. Um, and I can have those sails furled and unfurled. Which is really cool. If you want to delete any of these options, you just hit the, the negative button. You click the ones that you want to delete. And then you hit the negative button again. And it will uh, narrow those down. If you create the customizations that you want, and then you want to create and like save that as, as a saved prefab, just duplicate one of these prefabs, the one that you, maybe the one that you were using, um, go to your prototype token, grab the, uh, grab the control token for your new, uh, trireme, and then just assign token. And you may want to give it a name, like, you know, uh, my custom trireme. And you can make as many of these as you want. Let me show you what else you can change. Uh, first of all, I did want to point out that all of the sounds and lighting, everything is included in this. So you don't have to add that stuff. Let's go down to our lower deck. And uh, let's say that we want to upgrade to, you know, we've got all these different RAMs and they're all just available as an instant upgrade. Uh, this RAM has special lights that come with it, so you want to turn those on. And this is currently not moving, right? So we want to actually give it some ores that are out. And then we want to go to our lower deck and do the same thing. You may have to move these tiles around if they're not lined up properly. See if I can fix that in the release. But now we've got a full speed upgrade. We've got the hull that's upgraded. I'm going to turn these lights on as well because these look pretty cool when the lights go out. And yeah, we were able to do that just sort of instantly, right? Let's drag our player out. On the, on the deck. And, you know, let's even turn down our lights. This looks really great. You can see even the ambient sounds change when the lights go down. If the lights were on, we would hear all of our rowers rowing, but the lights are not on. Because this is a speed upgrade, we have this additional deck that's maybe where a wizard's room is. We can go all the way down to the bilge. This is where your players would sort of cavort and hang out. 
And now we want to go to the main deck. And this just looks so cool. Put some battle music on behind it, and you've got a pretty good uh, you got a pretty good boat to work with. And let's say that I want to actually sleep on this deck tonight. I might activate a couple of these fires. And now my players have it's just a nice little camp right in the middle of the ocean. So I just love this stuff, and I love that with multi-face tiles, we can do all of our customizations right here in a single prefab, and they're just all ready to go. I did want to talk about these configurator mo uh, macros that I made. I, I made these with the help of Ripper. I'm always asking him for macro help, uh, and he's way too kind to give it to me. But these have a little bit of information on how you can manipulate multiple assets at once. And they're all commented out, so they won't work until you remove the comments. Um, but if you see how I've got these generally laid out, um, you know, I can manipulate some common fields, like whether I want them all to be hidden so I can turn all my lights off, um, whether I want them to affect vision or walls or be affected, provide vision or be affected by walls. Um, I can change their color all at once. Uh, brightness, contrast. So here's, you know, bright and dim radius. So let's say that I wanted all of these, I wanted all of these lights to um, have a different radius. So we'll do a bright radius of, you know, 10 and a dim radius of 40. And if I get rid of these comments, and only these two attributes will be changed. Um, notice I have to have commas after each number. Your number has to be set up the right way. That's why I put some sample data in here. You've got to have quotes around your color hex code. So hopefully between uh, this information above and this, it'll help you. But the last thing I want to point out is that it'll only change what you've got controlled. So now that I've got all of these controlled, let me turn my lights down so you can actually see my my lighting radius. And if I execute this macro, you can see it just dramatically increased the radius of my light across the board. So you can do this with walls, you can do it with foreground and background tiles. If you think that I should add more fields to these, let me know. But you know, I just built these because these are the things I wanted to change most often you know, I, and then I can even create custom ones. Let's say I, I come up with a, a wall type that is just, you know, it's different than what Foundry gives me out of the box. I can set the flags the way I want them, get rid of the comments where I need them. And then I can save this as a new macro and call it, you know, uh, just um, light control wall. And I can use that over and over again. So hopefully you guys also make some use out of these macros. Makes it easier than trying to go into the console and figuring out these, these different... Um, values and, and how to set them up. So um, let me know in the comments if you like this system. So I hope you guys like this. I hope you like this release, or if you just learned something about active tiles and some other modules, uh, you know, let me know in the comments. Again, if you think there's more that I should uh, kind of go through, if you, anything didn't make sense, or if there's stuff you'd like me to cover in the future. But I'm really excited about this. I've already built a bunch of dungeons and I'm gonna build a bunch more. And with all these new uh, module capabilities um, in the new lighting from Foundry, it's just a really good time to be making maps right now. So uh, that's it. Uh, thanks everybody for joining me and, and have fun making your maps.